yesterday was the first time that they've actually been able to really enjoy that together. So, so we can help we can help out with that also. Well it's hard to say Daniel's the dogs and I was watching that. I was like, yeah, it's like, well, uh, so I think it's something like this.
Hello, my name is Tony Cetera and I am the director of the Atricos Theater Company's production of The Platinum House, written by Pat and Bob Reynolds. Following this performance, we'll be hosting a talkback segment in an attempt to provide feedback to the playwrights and actors and allow you, the virtual audience, the opportunity to express your reaction to the show. So, please stick around. And without further ado, I present to you the Platinum House. Scene one, the proposal. Four women in their 80s play bridge at a table in a sunny Florida break room. I'm Marge, a lifetime workaholic, world champion optimist, and still fit. I love yoga, tennis, and Eastern philosophy. Oh. I'm Nancy. I'm pretty clueless about most things. <laughs> I come from a poor family and didn't have many advantages growing up, so I turn to the Bible and my Bible studies classes for protection. I wear glasses and I try not to stand out in a crowd. I love to play bridge though, and I really like my bridge partners. I hope they like me too. I'm Emily. Some people say I'm dark. I say I'm a realist. A dark realist, if you will. My favorite book is T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Eliot was a realist. He was my kind of man. I'm Pat. I'm short like Napoleon. And I'm kind of a ringleader. My mouth definitely needs a zipper. And I hold the group together with a counselor's version of tough love. <sighs> the things we had to give up in those days to please the male world, political, religious, economic, and social. We played their game in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s to get access to their world. And where has that gotten us? Men can't live with them. Can't have children without them. We're still second class citizens and we're old. We played along and were played, lost ourselves as nurturing women and sold out the futures of our daughter's daughters. Access is everything. We only had access to what our husbands and the church deemed politically fit. I finally got a good hand, <laughs> thank God. Big game and made it happen. We aren't doing dishes tonight. <laughs> Four parts. Maybe it's an omen. The girls lay down their cards. Marge and Nancy have beaten Emily and Pat. Uh, I hate dishes. 
Do any of you have plans for the weekend? I'm going to the new Colin Firth movie. He's my favorite. I wouldn't kick him out of bed. <laughs> Les Clooney was waiting in the wings. <laughs> Pat, why do you always talk like that? Uh, is sex your favorite subject? No, I prefer food and money. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And what are you doing, Nancy? I have my Bible study group. How many times a week do you study your Bible? Six times, but I'd like to go more. Um, you know those are just stories, don't you? Jesus wouldn't lie to us. <laughs> oh, of course he lies to us. But you still got to believe him. Well, that's so silly. Mm, yes, it is. Hey, I want to make a proposal. And, and don't say no in the middle. Hear me out. Uh, I got to go pee. Uh, I got to go pee. Nancy runs to the bathroom. Do you think she has a bladder problem? Mm, I think she gets nervous around us, especially when we challenge her beliefs. <laughs> and that excites her urinary tract? <laughs> anyway, isn't that what real friends are supposed to do? The purpose of Zen is the perfection of character. Zen is as whack as the Bible. The perfection of character, please. Okay, maybe we'll just twiddle our thumbs while waiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling <laughs> after. <laughs> oh, I love that part about Jack breaking his crown. <laughs> Sorry, what did I miss? Pat was proposing that we have a sleepover and try a menage a quattro. That's silly. I don't even know what a menage a trois is. Um, <laughs> you're half right, Emily. Uh, I was thinking, we each pay exorbitant taxes, assessments, and maintenance fees, all live in big, empty houses. With the exception of this bridge game, I live by myself most of the time. Emily, you have four bedrooms. We could pay you rent, still have private rooms, and not be so isolated. That's crazy. We'd murder each other within a month. <laughs> uh, a week. I haven't lived with anyone in years, and I pray all at all hours of the night. Would that be an issue for anyone? Does your head spin or with vomit or Bible <laughs> verses coming out? <clears throat> mm. Do you speak in tongues or ever spit out gibberish in Russian? <laughs> <laughs> Only on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you watch TV evangelists at all hours of the day with the volume loud? <clears throat> No, but I like to wash my feet from time to time when they're dirty and sing songs to the Lord and fish. Sing out loud. We shall gather at the river, beautiful, beautiful river. Oh, we shall gather at the river and drown all the sinners in the... Oh, I like it. You have a melodious voice oh. and catchy phrasing. You'll have to teach us that ditty some, someday. <laughs> fish? I like to pretend I'm one of the disciples, fishy. Um, that makes sense, like a fisher of men. No, I just like to eat fish. Hmm. I got to think about it, Pat. I do have the only viable space, but I've always contemplated dying alone, usually by suicide, not found for weeks, alarmingly smelly, very Virginia Woof. Just me and my books in a room of my own. How cliche. <laughs> but you're right. Most elderly people do die alone. Not found for days. And that's actually kind of sad. The Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna said, Things derive their being and nature by mutual interdependence and are nothing in themselves. Meaning what? Meaning we could give each other so much. Live out our final days with a laugh or two, a sense of dignity, perhaps even mutual interdependence. If you weren't so optimistic, Marge, I'd smother you in your sleep. Perfect. She'd be just down the hallway when you get the urge. <laughs> I shared a tiny house smaller than this one with 11 people when I was growing up. I slept on a porch with my two sisters on a musty old sofa. It was crowded, but it was sure full of life. It was the best and the worst time of my life. We could share expenses, save a little money. It might be nice to leave a little savings to family. 
It's only for adults. Mm, only? We can still escape each morning, go our separate ways, play tennis, attend yoga classes, attend Bible study classes, walk, shop, hang out in coffee houses, whatever. Or my work. I'm listening for the voice of God. As usual, Pat, you seem to be getting your way. Me? <laughs> okay, here's a counter argument, and it's not negotiable. You all rent out your homes for one year, and we'll try this communal experiment and see what happens. If it doesn't work, we'll flip back to the way it was. No harm, no foul. We'll have a simple vote, with my vote counting as five. <laughs> <laughs> then I can die alone, peacefully, with just my books and a properly punctuated suicide That's note. That's a perfectly commonsensical assessment of the situation. <laughs> my dear Emily, you always were the best friend amongst us. Oh, flattery will get you everywhere, Pat. Marge, what do you think? I don't want to die alone. Card nights are the highlight of my week, and we're beginning to become friends, aren't we? Nancy? Jesus just whispered, amen, in my ear. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 <laughs> Scene two, the first breakfast. Morning shines on the four roommates as they eat breakfast. They pass around a cereal box. Who bought this cereal? I did. There were so many choices, I needed to wait until a brand jumped out. I stood in the cereal aisle waiting until a voice spoke to me. Spoke to you? Yeah, it's a pet peeve of mine. A whole aisle of cereal, sugarless, gluten-free, raw, fake this, real that. I can't even see the fine print, let alone understand the sciencey words. So yeah, I must listen for the voice. Hmm, the brand that sweet baby Jesus likes? God knows everything, why would he know breakfast cereal? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, because this has the manufactured sweetener saccharin um, that kills rats, lapsed Christians, and lab experiments. Saccharin used to be used in tab, that crushed glass toxic cola drink, remember? Mm, it tasted <laughs> like a bubbly death fizz. <laughs> God spoke to you about this brand of cereal? I couldn't see the fine print, so I listened. Even a good thing isn't as good as a no thing. A Zen quote. What is the sound of one hand clapping a koan? How did you know that? I took a comparative religion course a decade ago. Hmm, quite an impressive open mind, Nancy. No, I just wanted to have some ammo to defend the Lord. Uh, how's that working for you? <laughs> okay, I guess. I now know what to say if someone brings up the Santa Claus hypothesis. Ooh, I'm not going to even ask. I'm going to. What's the Santa Claus hypothesis? <laughs> that Santa and God are both white-haired old men looking down on us, judging whether we've been naughty or nice, and bringing gifts based on our daily behavior. Mm -hmm. One's for adults and one's for kids. <laughs> it's yin-yang. Oh my God. If we survive this breakfast, we'll survive the entire year. <laughs> <laughs> But in the future, maybe bacon and eggs might be easier. It's like the first supper, but it's the first breakfast. <laughs> I wonder if the disciples celebrated their first breakfast with fruit loops. <laughs> <laughs> I've yet to see that painting hanging in a museum. Andy Warhol might have attempted something like it. I think it was Wheaties Box. Mm. He did soup cans. Why not Wheaties Boxes? He did Marilyn Monroe, too. Everyone did Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, remember, everyone, happiness is a warm puppy. Ah, um, uh, Charles Schultz. <laughs> Good for you, Marge. You see happiness everywhere, don't you? Each moment is charged with life. Even in the cereal aisle. Well, God is everywhere. Why wouldn't he be in the cereal aisle? Pat's working on a crossword puzzle. My pet peeve is when people younger than me call me sweetie or dearie, or worse, when they hold my hand crossing the street and like to headbutt them into oncoming traffic, especially <laughs> if it's a cop. 
you should be taking care of more important things, right? Uh, you mean like corrupt city officials? Don't get me started on Chicago politics. Precinct captains delivered the exact percentages that Mayor Daley needed for 30 years. Stalin would have envied his tightly managed bureaucracy. Daley didn't kill people. The hell he didn't! <laughs> you might be more cynical than me, Pat. Anyway, my pet peeve is we elect representatives who don't represent us. Human nature is so easily corrupted. It's as if selling out was our national pastime. I can't figure out if, it's, if life's a tragic comedy or a uh, comic tragedy. That's how politics has always been. You're either with them or against them, and you damn sure don't want to be against them. The crazed writer poet Charles Bukowski wrote a short story called Politics is like screwing a cat in the ass. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know about that. I never did such a thing. No, not <laughs> Poor kitty. <laughs> What's a five letter word for sympathy? Would be Jesus. <laughs> Devil. Yeah. I have to run to the bathroom. Don't do anything without me. Nancy leaves. My Jack used to scoff at the way the political system worked. It put him into an early grave. He was so depressed he wanted to believe in the lies of the mainstream media and even faked it for the kids. But he was deeply unhappy inside. It ate him up. Stress leads to cancer. I tried to balance his depression with a false sense of happiness for the sake of the family. Nancy reappears and continues in thought. It'll be okay. I just know it will, whatever it is, if we just pray. Nancy, where do you think our original role models for God came from? Maybe those ancient exalted fellows who were the only ones allowed to read or write for 99.99% .99 of recorded history. And why do we call God the Father? Would a father let 29,000 children die each day due to preventable illnesses, poor water access, and lack of food? I think not. If God was a woman, she wouldn't let that happen. Maybe we should let the children run the world. You can't shake my faith with your blasphemous notions. Really, children running the world? Do you believe Jesus is God? Of course, I do. I, I don't know. I'm so confused. Well, life's confusing. But I'm happy when I read the Bible, and I love to get lost in the stories. You go, girl. Find that warm puppy and curl up next to him. <laughs> the eyes with which we see God are the same eyes with which God sees us. I find correlations and affinities everywhere. Don't use big words to knock my religion. <laughs> Nancy, I hate all religions equally. <laughs> Yours just appears to be the most benevolent of the bunch. Maybe because it makes sacrificial lambs out of all of us. You mean sheep. Go ahead and say it, Emily. If we're going to live together, we should be honest with one another. Mm, like you are? Nancy, it's possible you believed exactly what you needed to believe in order to be at peace in your community. Let me go back to talking about cereal boxes, please. <laughs> One of my pet peeves is when people change the subject just when things start to become interesting. Uh, how about them cubs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the big print giveth and the small print taketh away. Ironically, when it comes to cereal boxes, I can't see the fine print either. So I buy whatever's on sale. It's essentially cardboard with sugar. Education is what you get when you read the fine print. Experience is what you get if you don't. <laughs> Frickin' lawyers. Lawyers. Scene lawyers. three. First month anniversary. Marge stretches in the down doggy pose on a mat. Pat clips toenails, depositing them in an empty cereal box. Emily fusses with dishes while Nancy reads her Bible. A new day. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. 
Oh, that's what a musical was really a musical. <laughs> Songs that stayed with you, some even to this day. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to go where the brave dare not let you, to be the unbeatable. Me! <laughs> <laughs> sure, Pat, that's the Roger and Hammer Seeds version. Well, I have some of it. I forget things from time to time, don't you? I remember everything, selectively. <laughs> yeah. People, people who need people are the luckiest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could be our theme for this little experiment. You know, this first month has been tolerable, but I still hate the Mountie dishes. Oh, you're used to your privacy. It's been a win-win for me so far. I love that you let me sing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emily, for sharing your home with us. I'm staying busy in between meals with my favorite ladies. <laughs> and please, leave the dishes. I'll do them. Mm, nope. I'm trying to grow. I hated dishes when they were just mine, and now that we've got four sets, I really hate them. <laughs> but growth, with, growth without pain never lasts. Right, Marge? You've been reading my Zen books. Mm, they're next to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you do love to hate, don't you, Emily? <laughs> it's good to love something, Pat. But I'm working on that part of me as well. Hate is volatility awaiting transformation. Turn that hate energy into love energy. Yin yang, your internal perspective and your outer circumstances will change as well. <laughs> hate is love, freedom is slavery, war is peace. Orwell's 1984 is still the most pertinent novel we have. It takes the idea of doublethink to a new level. Ignorance is knowledge, truth is love, Trump is Biden. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance for idiots? <laughs> hey, that's not a bad title for a coffee table book. <laughs> <laughs> they should make a musical out of 1984 with high stomping leather boots. <laughs> <laughs> or Animal Farm with all those cute little Stalinist pigs. I remember when I was grieving for Bill and trying to stay strong. I go to church and couldn't cry. Even with my shrink, I was dry. Then Les Mis opened and that show broke the dam, sobbing the whole way. I saw it four times all over the world. It was my therapy. It cost almost as much too. On my own, pretending he's inside of me. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> inside me. A uh, past X-rated version of everything. <laughs> I sometimes pretend, fantasize, whatever you call it, about another time and place and even Jack. Is that why batteries are always on your shopping list? <laughs> <laughs> I can't control my dreams, Pat. Sometimes a dam breaks and washes over me. The invisible world's a strange and wonderful place and sometimes more real than this one. <laughs> What's wrong, Emily? I've never read 1984, <laughs> or Animal Farm, or Zen books, but I've studied the Bible to death. I rarely know what the heck you all are talking about, heck. That's why we're trying this little experiment, to expand our horizons. You make me think about the glorious stories in the Bible and how they relate to Eastern mythology. I'm taking classes at Second City when I go back to Chicago this summer to help expand my wings. They teach storytelling, stand-up, improv. We can all go back to school and, and learn a thing or two. There's a safe comfort zone I'm afraid to leave. Sometimes old habits are very hard to change. That's why you've got to change them. Otherwise, they control you. Do a jujitsu trick on your mind. Awake! 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 
remember when a standing ovation meant something? It was rare. It was only for the best of the best. Now Trevor Noah and Colbert get two minutes of mayhem just for showing up. It's crazy. It's undeserved. It's like kids getting trophies for everything under the sun. None of it makes sense anymore. Everyone's special, everyone's exceptional, everyone's entitled, and no one loses anymore. We're all the stars of our own TV show. It's called Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, don't get me started on social media. Sorry, I like Facebook. I want to see what my friends are doing. Mm -hmm. Someday you might not want to see all they're doing. <laughs> We live in the best of times. The Great War was over, the economy was booming, cars showed up in every driveway. When we flew, we dressed up. Flying was a treat. It was special. We were served dinner on white tablecloths, and the simplistic 50s allowed our backwardness to accelerate into the radical 60s. Touche. <laughs> Let's not sugarcoat it. The gays were still in the closet, and we were prejudiced, but didn't think we were. We liked that black cleaning lady, but didn't pay her much. Sex was a no-no, and only after marriage, and only to make babies. Plaster in public had to be polite and ladies. At least we all had TVs. Not my family. I used to stand in front of the appliance store and watch Peter Pan and Snow White and Sleeping Beauty for hours. That's so sad. It was. Now we get to watch election coverage for years, 24-7, and ad nauseum until we're guilt-tripped and devoted for the lesser of two evils. Nancy, were you ever resentful of your circumstances? I used to be, until I found Jesus. He was so much poorer than me, and all he ever wanted was for us to love each other. He practiced what he preached. Pretty simple idea that doesn't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. Jesus was fine, but what they did to him and the direction organized religion has taken him is beyond wackadoodle. I know you love everyone here, Nancy, but deep down, do you feel any resentment for having less? No, I feel fine. What's yearning inside of you to get out? I remember being five or six, standing in front of the appliance store for a whole TV show until I became aware of the pathetic nature of my nose rubbing up against the window, wanting. Haunting until the show ended, and then with the credits rolling, I turn with tears in my eyes and be angry with my father. Why couldn't he get us a TV set? I still cry myself to sleep at night from the shame. I had a real hate in my heart for my father for not providing everything my schoolmates had. In the end, I needed Jesus and his poverty. Save me from drowning in my own guilt. I'm so sorry. We, we have a gift. Nancy, you're the best. Your loving attitude keeps me upbeat and helps me be a better person. All I read about is death, and you have such a wonderful halo of light. I sometimes wonder why I worked my ass off all my life. I was afraid of not having enough. I just wanted to be normal and have all the attachments that go with being a good citizen. I was brainwashed into being the type of person I didn't even like. I missed out on my prime years chasing the dream. I'm only starting now in my final chapter to incorporate the yin and yang. You're lucky, Nancy, to have experienced the peaks and valleys fully in one lifetime. Oh, I never believed in myself. I always felt less than other kids. They talked about Christmas, birthdays, toys. We had nothing. I never felt pretty. I never flirted. I never looked good in a dress. Mm, I understand that feeling. I truly do. I felt that way inside, even though I had all this stuff on the outside. That's why I'm searching Eastern philosophy for answers to my inner emptiness. My mom took me to get a graduation dress, and then 
told me I was short and would never look good in clothes. And I never have. Not even at my wedding. Oh, we're all so screwed. I'll never be envious again. We don't know a person's backstory until we walk a mile in their glass slippers. <laughs> when we relate, we forgive. Did you just say that? I don't know, but that's how I feel. I'm beginning to see your attachment to Jesus. He was just a poor schmuck like the rest of us, an outcast who wanted more for others than himself and was willing to sacrifice his life for the common good. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth and men do not see it. Wow, it's here now. How awesome. I need to practice being more aware. Thanks, Nancy. Damn, girls, we should bottle up our 300 years of experience and, and sell it as wisdom to the next generation. <laughs> Write a self-help book. Create a stage play or make a documentary film about our trials and tribulations and how we stumble through. If each of us was a character in a book, in three words or less, describe yourself. Hmm. I am a dark horse, a very dark horse. Okay, you're up, Marge. I'm a very steady Eddie. I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's four words, and you're a big pain in the ass. <laughs> but a cute one. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Uh, what am I? I'm, I'm totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> we have a dark horse, a steady Eddie, a pain in the ass, and total confusion. That might make for an interesting TV show. <laughs> Do any of you think about death? I know I do. It's the only permanent date on our calendars. We go to great lengths to avoid it. Every ad shows us as perpetually young and beautiful. What I really need to know before I meet my maker is why does our private hair go to public places? <laughs> 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 Every day, the ticking of the clock goes by unnoticed, and maybe that's a good thing. We can practice living more in the moment, each moment as they become fewer and fewer, but more and more important. If I were terminally ill, like my husband was, I'd stop eating, or jump out of a plane without a shoot, or step off an ocean liner in the middle of the Pacific. Swim until it's over, laughing at the cosmic absurdity of life. Dear sweet Jesus, that is way too violent. I want something quiet and peaceful for my friends. I'd like to wake up dead. Wake up dead? <laughs> yeah, wow. like a good night's sleep that goes on forever. Mm. Mm. Continue to dream? That's a nice way of looking at it. A sleepover that never ends? Kind of like what we're doing now. We may not end up having much of a choice in the matter. Plane crash, or ocean liner sinking. We may need to suffer. Oh, who decides that? And how can a so-called loving God allow such pain? I never understood this. And why is escape from that pain mostly outlawed? I'd love to be able to call up the spirit of Dr. Kevorkian to help me my exit. Hart Crane, the poet, jumped off a boat in the middle of the ocean. Hemingway used his father's shotgun, and Virginia Woolf walked into a river with rocks in her pocket. Even Jesus metaphorically suicided himself on the cross. Kevorkian went to jail for killing people, and Jesus went to heaven for killing himself. Jesus didn't kill anyone. Kevorkian was a martyr for a cause. He suffered and died for us all. How's that different than Jesus? He assisted in suicides that are now legal in eight states. We should be allowed to have the dignity to choose our outcome when life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is no longer possible. Hmm. Eight states will soon be 50. I just hope Florida catches up soon. Once corporations figure out how to make money off the suicides, we'll have friggin' drive throughs <laughs> Surprise, they don't just poison us with cereal and tap. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs>
This whole conversation confuses me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> A knock interrupts their day. Emily opens the door. Oh, Billy boy, what are you doing here? I have business in Miami, flew into Orlando, picked up a car, and wanted to see how my favorite mom's doing in her new gig. Oh, gang, this is my Bill, my number three son. He'd be perfect. He wasn't a Republican. This is Marge. <laughs> Marge, the golfer, the volunteer, and Zen Buddha smoke. You have two boys. Here's some golf balls. Bill turns and hands Sylvia Platt's daddy and other poems to Emily. My phone conversations with mom can get a little long, so even I know your reading habits. Emily, I got you a gift because you were kind enough to open your house to mom. Oh, how did you know I was Emily? Your wardrobe betrays you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read this in years. Thanks, silly boy. It was daddy or Elliot's The Wasteland. Mom says you love the classics. Mm -hmm. So I did a coin toss and fake pick daddy. Fate always picks daddy. <laughs> ah, Nancy's just made her second joke this month. <laughs> Bill pulls out a cup hat for Nancy. Nancy, the cup band, bridge player, and the heart and soul of the Platinum House. Platinum House? That's what Mom calls this place. I wouldn't be surprised if she's writing a routine for Second City about all of her experiences here. She's probably hidden cameras in the plants and the toilets. <laughs> she always has a project to keep her juices flowing. In fact, Just Bill, I, no trade secrets. Your mom told you everything about us? She has a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she's a bit of a show off. She's the single biggest embarrassment of my life. Her mouth has a life of its own. It knows no boundaries. I mean, everyone's her audience. William Anthony Reynolds. Uh, ouch. I remember that tone. I'm in trouble now. I just came by to ask you, lovely ladies, if I could take you out to dinner tonight. Oh, we're cooking, Gary. Oh, can we vote on that, Pat? No. And, and where's my gift, Bill? Haven't I always been enough? <laughs> Bill's phone rings. He retreats. Is he for real? Where did you get him? He's perfect and so handsome. How did you train him so well buying us all dinner? You just met my husband. <laughs> Dead these many years, he shows up from time to time in the form of my son, Bill. <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. I have to renege on dinner. I just got ground floor seats to the Miami Heat game. <laughs> I need to drive down to Miami pronto to pick up the tickets. But on the way back, it's dinner for sure. Oh, we're already cooking dinner. Thank you very much. And we're having our amateur night this evening. Amateur night? Sounds almost as interesting as a basketball game. <laughs> Is this another opportunity for mom's comedy routines? Again, I'm sorry. But I'll see you all for dinner on the rebound. Oh. <laughs> see, he's not so perfect. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd still trade for him. Me too. <laughs> mm, me too. <laughs> Scene four, amateur night. Balloons pepper the ceiling. Salsa music fills the room. Wine bottles stand uncorked while the ladies wear costumes. I don't remember. Why did we agree to amateur night? This was a Pat idea thingy. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Bill recognized it immediately. Pat wants to practice her latest material on a live audience. <laughs> we all agreed. We're becoming too serious. Pat suggested this might break us out of that. And I, for one, am grateful to try anything new, as long as it doesn't hurt another living being. But guests were your idea, Marge, not mine. I know, I know, but that was before I realized I had no talent. Fear should be long gone by our advanced ages, ladies. <laughs> uh, I'm not afraid to fail in front of you girls. I just don't want to screw up in front of my guests. <laughs> We only have one guest each to worry about. I'm sure we all picked handsome young men, right? The doorbell rings. 
Emily answers in Brad, 40. The handsome tennis pro shows off his tan, carrying two bottles of wine. The girls swoon around him. <laughs> Have I got the right place? I brought a house gift. You all look so, so lovely. Were we supposed to wear costumes? I didn't know. Here's the white and red wine. Mm, I'll take the wine. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Brad. I look forward to my tennis lesson tomorrow. I saved you a seat right over here. I'll sit on the other side. Can I sit on your lap? <laughs> Three jokes in one month. <laughs> I wasn't joking. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't your religion forbid sex until one is married? I think it forbids it even after that. <laughs> no. They just forbid us from enjoying it. Ah, <laughs> oh, very funny. That's, am I the first guest to arrive? Yes. <laughs> we can wait until the others show up before we start the show. Mm, pour the wine, ladies. I'd like to propose a toast to our one and only guest. What? No, really? <laughs> <laughs> I did get four very odd, very inviting invitations that seem mm, a little redundant. Very inviting? Mm, perhaps mine was a little overkill. Sorry, I do like to write. <laughs> How clever you all are, and what an honor to be your one and only guest. Four wide. A talent show was promised four times. Now I understand the wardrobe, ladies. <laughs> Showtime! Mark, the luck of the straws and the fact that you're the only one ready, commence the cheer. Marge wears a cheerleading costume circa 1955. The high school St. Jude is emblazoned across her chest. Give me an A! A! a. Give me another A! A! a. Give me an R. R! R! Give me a P! P! A A R P A A R P. What's that spell? R R R. <laughs> Mark finishes with the splits on the floor, much to everyone's astonishment. Oh, well done, Mark! <laughs> you saved that uniform from back in the day. Can you still fit into it nicely? <laughs> well, cheerleading was my thing in high school. I led a troop of young ladies who could do the splits on command. Well, it hurts to watch you. My hip just dislocated. <laughs> it got us all husbands in college. I wasn't allowed on my school squad because I couldn't afford the outfit. And I couldn't do the splits. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Girls at that age could be so self-absorbed. I know I was. Oh, we thought the whole world revolved around dances, boys, and football games. Oh, I would have killed to become a member of the cheerleader squad. Mm, I would have killed myself if I became a member. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us, Emily, just tried to look and act alike. That's what was expected in those days. Conformity was our national religion. Still is. Okay, everyone say yes. Ready? Three, two, one. Yes! yes. <laughs> oh, I lost myself in that TV window, watching, craving to be that perfect little girl I saw on nightly broadcasts, the perfect child in the perfect cereal commercial. <laughs> One perfection for all. That always tripped me up. Sorry, it's a minor flaw. I need to outgrow. Whoa, gals. This is supposed to be a party, not a therapy session. <laughs> Give me a C. 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 Give me an R. R. Give me an A. A. Give me a P. P. What's that spell? Crap! <laughs> <laughs> well, that AARP cheer just took a dark turn. We almost put Brad into an early retirement coma. <laughs> Keep the wine coming and I can listen to almost anything. <laughs> no worries, my mother and her friends have an opinion about everything. Your mother? Is that how you see us? Your mother and her friends? Dad, he's only here because we invited him to a free dinner and a few drinks. He's half our age, ladies. I'm just a poor tennis instructor in a well-to-do community who's hungry and 
thirsty most of the time. <laughs> Pat's just offended that you see us as mother types. Sorry, Pat, but my mother's my best friend. <laughs> Some of us were professionals with dozens of people working under us, and now we're part of a system that puts old folks out to pasture. If I didn't live at home with my mom, I'd come live with you, ladies. You discuss real issues, the substitute stuff, behind all the fake stuff, not just pain medication. Oh, we discuss pain medication, too. <laughs> Are you remotely attracted to older women? Just my mom. Mm. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> to middle-aged women? Not really. To younger women? Nope. To women? Oh my god, we outed you, Brad. I didn't know. We're so sorry. I'm always rubbing up against you at tennis lessons. <laughs> trying to hit on you and showing off in front of you and showing you off to all my friends. Oh, I never knew. I'm so sorry. Let's be honest, ladies. You'd have as much chance of having sex with me as you would with a macho, heterosexual tennis pro in his 40s. Those guys are always cavorting around with the 30-year-old divorcees. I should know. I did on those guys, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next up on tonight's talent show agenda, our very own resident writer, Miss Emily. An enigma, for sure. Total mystery surrounds this act. Emily skates while juggling two plastic bowling pins. She circles, almost falling, drops the pins, and continues circling, giving high fives to all. She flops down in a chair, exhausted. Who knew you could skate or juggle? Or both? <laughs> My first job was a dry, at a drive-in diner as a waitress on skates, delivering shakes and burgers. I used to be able to juggle three pins on a unicycle. That's when I read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment and realized there was much deeper world out there than our American graffiti pop culture. Kind of a weird twist, huh, Emily? One minute it's the fluffy 50s and the next it's the existential 60s. Mm, our sad nature always fights with our happy nature to find some sort of balance. Very Jungian, very Zen, right, Marge? I'm so relieved you're all here providing some contrast to my brooding thoughts. Otherwise, I'd be lost. Some nights in the past, I'd walk around the house until first light and then plop down, exhausted on the sofa, and sleep all day. That is so sad. Balance is everything. Yes, it is. We shouldn't complain too much. We've had the best of times. We can complain, but We've got to be grateful, too. That's why I turned my life over to Jesus, so I can stop worrying about everything. Mm, that seems like an abdication of responsibility. You don't need to think anymore? Is that what you're saying, Nancy? I mean, you might as well be dead. Wait, what? You are totally confused. <laughs> Do you ladies always carry on like this? It's fascinating. It keeps us from getting bored. Sorry. We have so few guests that we sometimes forget that they're here. <laughs> well, I for one am glad I live in a world where I can tell my friends I'm gay and they won't shun me. Although I don't dare tell my employer. So yeah, lots of things have gotten better, some things not so much. Florida, unfortunately, is Florida. But you're so lucky to have found each other. So lucky to be able to say anything. Does your lifestyle bother your family? I think it bothers them more than they let on. That's terrible. I feel sorry for them. They're so programmed. Nancy dances to classic stripper music. Da -ba -da -bum -ba -da. She kicks high, her legs removes the gloves seductively and strips down to an old fashioned slip. Take it off! Take it off! <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Nancy, that's in the Bible. That's the dance of Salome. The dance of the seven veils. The dance of salad. Who? 
<laughs> Where did you get the idea for a strip tease show? I'm Who so thought? afraid. <laughs> but I figured that's why I should do it. Right, Marge? And knowing Brad's gay made it much easier. <laughs> I became gay just to help you out, Nancy. <laughs> and now, I have to surprise you all. Not only am I gay, but I'm a staunch Republican. Oh, <laughs> you should have met my son, Bill. Is he gay? Not that I know of, but he's a staunch Republican. And most Republicans are closet Most. Uh, do you have any statistics to back that up? 69%. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. Now that's funny. <laughs> I don't hate gays. That's homophobic. But I do love Trump. I hate Trump. Mm -hmm. I like people who hate Trump. <laughs> <laughs> How many gay people do you know that voted for Trump? Two. Me and my boyfriend, Gary. Uh, Gary? Personal trainer at the club? He's gay? Yep, that Gary. I had to change religions and become a Republican to finally get a date with him. Uh, Love is more important than religion and politics, don't you think? I switched to Trump for he's Gary. <laughs> <laughs> that is so crude, Pat. <laughs> and true. Next up, last but certainly not least. Straight from Second City in Chicago, it's our very own Tina Fey Pat Pat. <laughs> you know, stand up is what I would have done with my life if I didn't have those six changey kids. <laughs> but seriously, folks, it's no picnic being 86. You wake up, the battle begins. You roll over and you gotta be, right, Nancy? <laughs> so you move or you pee. It all depends on whether you got the pens. <laughs> so you you do that, and and then then there's plastic bed sheets. They are mandatory in eighty, and so is a petite vibrator. Am I right, ladies? <laughs> if you were Catholic in the fifties, the biggest sin was sex, and the only birth control was guilt and girls. <laughs> Try penetrating one of those. And my mom said men only wanted one thing. But she forgot to tell me what. <laughs> and that very same mom said, Patricia, do you know why women don't smile during foreplay? Because there's never enough time. <laughs> when I was little, she called the forbidden paradises up there and down there. At 12, they became known as no no and never. <laughs> Recently, I watched Orange is the New Black with my granddaughter. Oh my god. I finally know the difference between the three Bs. Virgin, Viagra, and Vagina. And it only <laughs> took me a lifetime. <laughs> Being 86 makes one obsessed with death. I googled caskets. And they're so expensive these days. I tried pet caskets and three popped up. There was Sexy Barbie, that's a pink car for a gay dog with Ken and Barbie in the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cry out and everything. <laughs> and then there was Helly Hello Kitty, which smells like kitty litter. Oh, for eternity? Ugh. And, um, but if I live one more year and shrink one more inch, I can purchase. Fido's hideaway for forty nine ninety five. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll just use a sandwich bag for my ashes. As time goes on, one understands less is more. <laughs> you know, people ask me, Pat, how would you like to die? And I say, with a scotch in one hand and hugging dogs dripping all over me. <laughs> <laughs> We are so lucky. <laughs> Laughter unburdens the soul. I feel so light tonight. Thanks for ending the show on such a high note, Pat. When can I move in? <laughs> Flames are adorable. I can show you a trick if you want. It's my only real talent, I think. Besides changing my religion and becoming a Republican, it's what won Gary over. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Brad. I hope it's another striptease. <laughs> he puts a cherry stem in his mouth 
and pulls up his sleeves and retrieves a coin from his pocket, holds it up, and presto, gone. Finds it in Marge's ear. <laughs> a quarter for your thoughts. <laughs> uh, Gary likes that slate of hand technique. Uh, Brad pulls out the cherry stem tied in a knot. I think Gary likes the tongue thing. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope this night never ends. This has been so much fun. We must declare a five-way tie. All for a tie, raise your hands. <laughs> Best night ever. You're such a good soul, Marge. I know I will feel so much lonelier at home with my mother, seeing and feeling the gracious, loving vibe in this house. Amen, sister brother. Amen. Amen. Scene five, the come to Jesus meeting. The roommates lounge around. Pat eats ice cream directly from the container. Marge and Nancy compete, adding puzzle pieces to a Buddha statue, while Emily is buried in a comic book. Hey guys, we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. It sounds interesting, Pat, but you can come to one of my Bible study groups anytime if you want. And I, it's called a come to Jesus meeting because it's supposed to be honest, revealing, and forgiving. But more importantly, we'll save thousands in shrink spills and unload our excess baggage. A psychiatrist? I've never needed one. Or was it a psychologist? I'm not sure what the difference is. One dispenses pharmaceutical drugs and the other pharmaceutical advice. <laughs> At least a psychologist pretends to listen before they dispense drugs. Let's listen to each other. Give feedback, forgive, and save money. I'm all for saving money. I went to a shrink for 20 years and all I got was a certificate of completion. <laughs> completion of what? 20 years, 50 visits a year, a thousand sessions, a hundred thousand dollars, and a million mother's little helpers. All for what? What a waste of time, money, and guilt. I needed to go to a psychologist for a year just to forgive myself for going to a psychiatrist for decades. <laughs> we all fell for that crap. Maybe Nancy knows something we don't. At least Jesus is mostly free. What exactly were you thinking of having us do, Pat? Girls, we're all getting to know each other. Why don't we sit around and be honest about our past and see where it takes us? Unburden any lingering mistakes and give ourselves a clean slate. Tell secrets. Stop stepping on eggshells. Stop being phony. Hmm, I kind of like that. It's so not me. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived alone for so long that I haven't shared a single important thing with anyone. It may be good for us. We each share one secret, one wound that might cleanse our ledgers. Perhaps in the process, we can help each other. Okay, but can we pour some wine first? <laughs> Nancy pours the wine. <laughs> okay, if someone says something and one of us is unclear, we can call it bullshit. And that person will have to defend their point of view. Why would Does that sound reasonable to you? Oh, why would we question someone's story? Pat doesn't want to let us off the hook before we shuffle off this mortal coil. And seeing how she's our resident counselor, what do we got to lose? Okay, I'll start. But let's also promise that what's said here stays here. So we're not afraid to share, okay? Okay. So, one day, I had a revelation. My mom and dad should never have married, and I shouldn't be here. My mom was quite a beauty, cultured and virtuous. My dad was handsome and loved all things rugged. Mom was an ardent Catholic and dad was an ardent nothing. They had five quick kids and mom got bored and missed her cultured life. So when the World's Fair opened in Chicago, the biggest event ever, and dad couldn't take mom, he asked his best friend, well, they went, drank rum, cooked up, and mom got pregnant. She had an abortion and was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Not for the infidelity, but for the abortion. But years later, she went to a bishop, confessed her sins, and 
was absolved. Then she went back to church with a vengeance every single day. So when I decided on my own to become a Catholic in high school, my mom was really, really proud. In my sainthood, I had six kids and mom adored me. But then after my Bill's premature death in 1984, nothing seemed logical. There were priests who abused children, poor people who had to choose between no sex or too many kids. So I just stopped going to church. Mom was a livid because I was a huge part of her redemption. One day, years later, I got a message that said, your mother's dying, come. So of course I flew to her bedside, heartbroken. I placed my hand on her chest and she pushed it aside with two shallow breaths and died. My mother feared a human institution more than she loved me. It all haunts me now. But my mother needed someone to blame besides herself, and I'm glad I was there for her. She rejected you on her deathbed? She pushed me away in her final moment. My mother gave me who I am, warts and all, and I forgive her. She was passive aggressive, but I'm to blame too. I withdrew. I still hope to find some peace before I die. Saying it out loud helps. Don't ever push anyone away. It always comes back to blame, doesn't it? Do we blame others for the choices we make? Or do we accept our own culpability? Do we learn from the past or are we condemned to repeat it? I just want a little peace of mind when I close my eyes for the last time. I didn't know we were gonna go so deep. Oh dear. I'm not sure I can come up with anything. Nancy, it sounds like you need to go next. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna get this over with. The truth is, the truth is I never got married, I just told everyone I did. If I had a husband, I'd be normal. Old maids alone are suspect. I made up the name Peter. If I had known it meant penis, I would have picked something different like Willie. <laughs> 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 When I arrived in my Florida retirement community over a decade ago, everyone talked about colleges, kids, husbands, travel. I felt like I had nothing, so I created a new me. I took bridge lessons, cooking classes, joined a book club, and hid in my Bible studies classes. When I met you all, I was so afraid I'd fail again. I just continued the husband's story to fit in. I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's horrible. You're so funny, level-headed and consistent. We're lucky to have you in our communal experiment. We were all born with silver spoons in our mouths, and that's done nothing for our characters. The Gospel of John said, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I lost that teaching somewhere along the way. You're a good egg, Nancy. <laughs> There's more. I lived in a small town in Nebraska where everyone knew everyone. My dad was a bartender. We lived above a tavern. We had an outhouse and my mother sewed curtains to make a little money. I knew I was smart, but I always felt stupid. Growing up, I was ashamed of my upbringing and my parents. I'm now at 85, it's almost over, and I have not done anything with my life but lie. We know so little about each other. What did you do before the retirement community? When I turned 18, I became a secretary. 
and worked for the same company for over 50 years. Edward, my boss, <laughs> um, well, I helped him as best I could, you know, making reservations, um, buying beautiful gifts for his wife, giving advice. He wanted no relationship with his son, Eddie, just because he smoked pot. Well, I convinced him otherwise. When Edward died suddenly, young Eddie stepped up and took over the business. Edward left me a good pension, but I'll cry when I say this. Young Eddie called one day out of the blue and gave me 20,000 shares of the family stock. And that was my ticket to a comfortable retirement. Mm. Were you um, in love with Edward? From day one. <laughs> I think I hit it pretty well because Betty liked me and invited me to all the family functions. I guess Edward never saw me looking. I lived through small moments of light touching. A hand, an elbow. Moments that I interpreted as more than they were. I lived through Edward's family. We needed a family to survive all those decades. How brave. We must adapt to survive. That's so Darwinian. So, so the Bible thing is more of a shield you hide behind? I cling to it like a close friend, like my only friend. Jesus was celibate, so why couldn't I be? Bible studies where I found a community of people who didn't judge me for my past. I guess that's the only real qualification. I guess the only real qualification is to be a sinner. I do like that about Catholics. <laughs> if you show up on Sundays with a small bottle of money, they'll forgive you for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I am not that cynical about the church. Mm. There's a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love. Uncooked people delight in the gaudy. Well-formed people delight in the ordinary. <laughs> Which are we? I think we're ordinary sinners. But we can also forgive, can't we? Emily slouches to the floor with a ukulele and sings. My depression is my confession. My confession is my depression. <laughs> You're not depressed. You are wonderful. Stop it. Emily hurts all the time. She hides it well. Are you still taking your meds? Mm. When I remember. Okay, here's my past taboo story. My dad abandoned me when I was seven. He hung himself. I have taken medication in the past, but it's always seemed to make matters worse. As a child, I was told to buck up. How do you outgrow seeing your father swinging in the garage? I wanted to see a counselor, but mom said, no shrinks in my family. That's how she dealt with it. Like it never happened. I hid inside my books. I wanted to rebel. I drank and drugged for a while, but it poured fuel on the fire. I slit my wrist once. Mom was cold and my brother was cast aside. He's more lost than I am. He doesn't have books or roommates to lean on. The dark hours are fewer now and further apart. There's so little time left for me to forgive myself. I know I didn't do anything wrong, but I still feel this deep pain of not belonging. I must be guilty of something, right? I guess you could say I had the all-American family. Emily, where's this misplaced pain go? Mm -hmm. I've always directed it toward myself. I had to stop this vicious cycle, and believe it or not, you're all helping. I'm not afraid to say anything here, and that feels like forgiveness. To err is human, to forgive divine. Amen. Do you want to contribute, Marge? How can I possibly follow those powerful stories? Give it a try. <laughs> you might surprise yourself. Okay, what have I got to lose? 
One thing I never told you was, in my house, I had to be a perfectionist. I couldn't stop for a moment and relax. Always little Miss Perfect because my dad was the great Santini, literally. Was he a magician? Mm. He's great. a literary figure. Pat Conroy, a Southern writer, wrote about his father, the great Santini, who stayed a military man long after he was discharged from the service and ran his home like a drill sergeant. That's awful, Marge. I couldn't have said it better. Thanks, Emily. Up at 5 a.m., march to the flagpole, hand to the heart, pray to the United States of America, done with breakfast by 6 a.m., study another hour before school, anything less than an A merited a week in my room, home from school, check the chore board, help mom with dinner, more study, bed by nine, no dreams allowed. I became dutiful, obedient, the champ. It kept me safe. I don't think he even knew he hit me. He's dead these many years, but his growling voice colors every imperfect thing I do. Why is this dead man's voice still in your head? I was never good enough. I was never complete. I was never free to be me. So, I had to be little Miss Perfect. Mm -hmm. Amen to that, sister. That's me in a nutshell. You're not alone, Mark. Something happened to each of us that affected our natural development and stunted our full potential. We need to get out of our own way and let go before it's too late. Why didn't I let myself be more vulnerable? Maybe each of us, uh, each of us only gets the baggage we can handle. <laughs> Maybe we should hug more and talk less. Maybe. Maybe. Scene six, Amelia's visit. The ladies read books and magazines. Amelia bursts through the front door, packages in hand, followed by a serious looking short man, Jones, in a chauffeur's uniform carrying more boxes. Oh God, she's here. My Amelia, the private contractor's surveillance expert. I told you about it. Ha ha, mommy dearest. We can do introductions <laughs> later. We've got a lot to do and very little time to do it in. Jones, drop the boxes and be back in 11 minutes. I know you've been here for a while, Mother, but I've come to properly situate you. I hope you kept your own bedroom. You know I can afford a new home for you if you want. You don't need to share your house with strangers. Um, they're not strangers, they're my friends. How quaint. We're settled in, thanks, sweetie. All right then, Peapod will be dropping off a delivery every Tuesday. It's healthy gourmet meals, and if you want to work it into your diet, you'll live longer. The junk you can get yourself. Sweetie, we only eat junk. We're trying to die off as soon as possible to financially benefit our greedy heirs. What? What? Is Jones your lover? Here's a list of the local doctors. I read to them all and rate them from best to worst. They're concierge doctors, very well respected. Send me the bill, mother. Interesting. That was a denial about Jones. <laughs> <No, it wasn't. laughs> Are these uh, local doctors expensive? Starting Monday, you'll receive the New York Times, Wall Street <laughs> Journal, USA Today, and the local paper, so you won't have to fight. We love to fight. It keeps us young. Amelia, we don't want the periodicals. We have everything we need. Mother, I don't have time for your objections. Amelia, are you talking <laughs> <laughs> so nice to everyone? I try. Mm -hmm. People who don't understand sarcasm are awesome. <laughs> 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 oh, my kids would never try to run my life. Nor mine. And if they did, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> You're welcome. I was bored to help. Ta-ta, Mother. I hope the situation goes well for you. Pick them out if you want. I have very competent lawyers. <laughs> Say hi to Jones for us. Oh, she scares me. She's a cannibal. I get the New York Times. Amelia rushes back in, drops a final box on the table. I almost forgot. I brought a gift for you. It's a lifeline. Don't ever take it off or you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a threat. <laughs> a lifeline. 
It's a medic alert system attached to your body. I don't want to thank her. I want to obliterate her. When did she become so controlling? Oh, I can't entirely blame her. She's been taking care of me since she was three. She used to run warm, not hot baths. She's always put the pieces of the puzzle back into place for me. Maybe we can donate our lifelines to a retirement company. <laughs> well, at least let's have Amelia back to plan our funerals. Oh, she means well. So did Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's not that bad. She's pretty bad. <laughs> and I don't have kids. And you love everyone. I know, right? Like three-day-old fish. Three weeks. Three months. <laughs> I did indulge her a little. A little? <laughs> Scene seven, Pat's birthing story, a new day. Pat lays down phone in disbelief. <sighs> Grandchildren, can't live with them. Too late to abort them. <laughs> 16 is a lot. You were a rabbit mama. <laughs> yeah, I did eat a lot of salad when I was younger. After schmoozing me, Dylan said, Oh, Grandma, I've missed you. I think about you all the time. Then he asked if he and his three pals could come by for spring break. Fortunately, because of our situation here, I got to say, sorry, no room at the inn. In the past, I would have occasionally indulged. Then, of course, after the call, I felt that weird strain of Catholic guilt. I can't blame him for trying, but... Saying no to grandkids has become an art form refined over many years. Last year, my three granddaughters came to visit Disney World. And me. <laughs> they begged to go, and of course I paid for it. It was over a thousand dollars for two days. <laughs> you're both blessed to have them. I know, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy. But it's like they're conditioned to want and demand constantly. Where does that come from? Children not born that way. It's not them. It's TV, movies, and 24-7 advertising. Pat, can I ask you a personal question? Shoot. Why did you have all those kids? <laughs> the Pope made me do it. Oh. <laughs> he forced me to avoid sinful condoms, illegal according to the Catholic doctrine. Through the art of abuse of guilt, we abstain, waiting for the monthly rhythmic sessions, avoided protection, and created a private army of little Catholics. <laughs> We're still blaming, aren't we? We could have abstained. Mm, or used a vibrator. <laughs> Are you kidding? It was a drought until I got married, but once the floodgates were open, I was off to the races. <laughs> once I got the hang of it, we put a trapeze over the bed, and every night was a contortionist speech. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it might be dangerous. Only <laughs> if you do it right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Pat was kidding. Well, sort of. <laughs> Pat, what's your children's birthing story? Oh, I'll give you the short version. Married in July 1959, sobbing in October. I'm barren! But alas, that was just the raging hormones of a pregnant woman. Robert arrived in July 1960, Joe came in August 1961, Jimmy in February 1963. I was exhausted, befuddled. What to do next? Practice birth control and go straight to hell? So I went to a priest. Mm, did he get you pregnant too? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he suggested with all the weight of the Pope behind him that we try the Catholic family rhythm plan. It goes like this. Uh, you can have sex the first three days of the month, a drought, and then sex the last three days of the month. It worked for three months and then bam, I was pregnant. Remember, this was a plan created by creepy old men in long red dresses with slippers. <laughs> Make it sound like pedophiles. Uh, you think? Later, I delivered twins. Seven and eight pounds, three weeks late and six minutes apart. Three doctors came to my room and told me I was did not have a normal twins, but superfetation twins, conceived at the beginning and end of the month. That was it. After that, come hell or high water, I ate the pill like it was candy every day, sometimes twice a day. But like a slug, I forgot them when the spring, at the spring when Bill and I went to the Kentucky Derby. And in the deepest, coldest snow of 1967, I delivered Katie. Six kids, 
six years. You finally got a vibrator, right? <laughs> no, but the IUD that had just been invented and it became my personal savior. That's the story of Jesus. <laughs> six kids in six years and the church abandoned me. Are you kidding? All they wanted was future donations, a bigger diocese. And all I wanted was to take walks and read a book. The truth is, I, I never wanted kids, but that program was not built into the system. Get married, have a family, get a house, a white picket fence, blah, blah, blah. I don't regret it, but I was held captive to an old narrative. I made sure they were all fed, clothed, and loved, but they each missed out on the intimacy that they deserved. That's my biggest regret. You can't give what you ain't got. You're being too hard on yourself, Pat. Bill's an angel. It's not that I didn't love them. It just felt like I didn't make the choice. Like it was made for me somewhere out there. No wonder you're you, Pat. What's that supposed to mean? Get a vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a child, even an adopted one. Hiding inside another family for a lifetime shouldn't have excluded me from being a mother. Mm -hmm. You always put things in perspective. Okay, girls. I need your 300 years of wisdom on something. My granddaughter, Danielle, says she thinks she might be gay. What does that even mean? Mm, maybe she's confused. Do I encourage her? Discourage her? Or what? I know Jesus says it's wrong, but maybe he's wrong. Jesus lived with 12 men, disciples who would do anything he wanted, including wash his feet. Yeah, true, but... And he lived with a virgin. 13 dudes and Mary's still a virgin? Something ain't adding up here, girls. <laughs> maybe they were all gay. Or maybe just Mary. <laughs> yeah. Like Danielle. <laughs> My Danielle is a beautiful, sweet, and caring person. Jesus loved the outcast most. Well, he didn't trip people up. He loved them all equally, didn't he? Marge tried talking with her. Communication is missing from most relationships. I asked her what's, what's confusing her, really. Communication can't hurt. I'll try talking. Scene eight, The Last Supper. A dinner table displays a festive meal. A birthday cake for Marge with two big white candles shaped like an eight and a four contrast the chocolate frosting. That was delicious. <laughs> I've never had lamb chops quite like those. Glazed to perfection. And in the cream spinach, did I taste nutmeg? Yeah, mom's recipe. She may still be the best cook ever. Her pies were too. Died. Why didn't you make one? Mm -hmm. Because I was too busy buying a birthday cake. <laughs> My mom was a good cook. Up until Dad disappeared her. Disappeared her? She wandered around the house like a zombie. She stopped contributing because Dad always put her down. Years later, I found out she and the postman met secretly on Wednesday afternoons. <laughs> I'm so glad she had some joy in her life. Maybe Dad sensed it. Maybe that's why he was always so angry. He wouldn't associate with anyone. He got more demanding, more abusive, until she finally disappeared. When I was 15, she died of heart failure. Oh, a broken heart. Mm. That's so sad. Happy birthday to you, Marge. You are a miracle. We all are. We share so much in common. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear sweet Marge. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm pooped. Thank you, one and all, for the best year of my life. <laughs> We started this little experiment near my last birthday. Who'd have thought we'd still be here now? I don't want this adventure to ever end. 
I'm going to read a little Zen and crash hard. If you cannot find the truth right where you are, where do you expect to find it? <laughs> Won't you stay for one small sliver of cake? I'll have a big piece tomorrow. <laughs> It'll give me something stupendous to dream about. March exits. <sighs> How does she do it? Up before all of us, golf, tennis, and she's hiked her 10,000 steps before dinner. She must think the great Santini's still watching. He's too good to be true. I think she's right. This has been one of the best years of my life. It's never too late to grow. Well, good night, ladies. Good night, friends. Good night. Scene nine, the final curtain. Emily cooks. The morning ritual is in full swing. Pat attempts to sit in yoga posture on the sofa while doing a crossword puzzle. Nancy enters with her hair fixed, looking sexier than ever. Oh, last word. Eight letters ending in L uh, regarding attitude toward life. Grateful. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know what I'm fixing this morning? Pray tell. Pizza eggs. Oh, what's that? Um, it's pizza crust with tomatoes, cheese, pesto sauce, bacon, and eggs over medium. Probably not the healthiest meal. I, I could add kale. And never you mind on that kale. Some of us don't want to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> Smells like dinner. Where's Marge? Probably doing 5,000 steps before breakfast to show off. <laughs> she was going to pay bills this morning. I'll, I'll check those later. Pat disappears. We hear knocking and calling out, Marge, in the distance. Pat runs back to the living room, stricken. She woke up dead. She woke up dead. What? Oh my gosh, she woke up dead. Emily and Nancy leave the room. We hear gasps and they return. Emily has a diary in hand. Why do the best always die first? I grow up, I want to be Marge. She saw everything so clearly. I need to sit down. This can't be real. This can't be. All this time, Marge kept a diary beside her bed. We're not going to read that. We should read some of it. Let, let's vote. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can help us understand a little. Nancy, just the first and last entry. Emily opens a diary and reads as Marge's voice fills the stage. Day one, I'm here, I'm used to living alone, having things my own way, but the extra money will come in handy. These are fascinating women, experienced with full lives. Nancy never seems to put her Bible down. Emily hides near the sink, and Pat thinks she runs the show. Time will tell, but patience is a virtue. So I'll watch and wait and keep chugging along. Zen is the art of doing nothing wrong. Wow. She really saw us clearly from the start. She sure did. Now here's what she wrote last night. Day 364. Great meal tonight. Pat's mom's recipe. I think I overdid it. I'm exhausted, but in a good way. It was the best birthday of my life. I feel so light. I've made lifelong friends. Nancy's putting her Bible away and becoming one of the gang. Emily's hiding less in the dishes, and she's damn funny, too. Pat even votes sometimes. They get me. They really get me. That's all you can ask for in life. A few friends who really know you. No reading tonight. Off to bed, to the great dream world in the sky. Big piece of cake in the morning. Zen, in its essence, is the art of seeing into the nature of one's being, and it points the way from bondage to freedom. Way to go, Marge. Wow, what a way to go. From bondage to freedom. She woke up dead. She woke up dead. Wow. That must be heaven. You must be? I can't wait.
Thank you all for your attention. I'd like to introduce now Bob Reynolds to uh, moderate our talk back. Um, I'm very grateful to everyone who's put all the time and effort into this. Uh, my mom's play is something that came out of her life experience. And the structure and the characters are riffs on, on her life experience and her friends she's known. Um, as I watched the play as a co-writer with her, I, I wonder if each of the characters would come up and at least talk a little bit about whether they feel that their arc does have, in a one-act play, a, a true beginning, middle, and end. Um, and if there's any suggestions they have for Pat, it would be awesome uh, to put them forward, but to not be helpful. So let's, go, let's go in the order of introductions. I've seen one, yeah. This is Linda Sajara by March. Talk to this camera. Okay. But you want to <laughs> just elaborate on your character, whether you feel there's a full arc there, Fully developed. Oh, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed playing this character. Um, I just felt like it, the character was very well um, developed and um, she, you know, she just, there were a lot of, she was complex but um, fun and um, I just felt like, yeah, she just she went the full, the full arc for sure. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I really enjoyed the, the character and, um, and I'm really glad I got Play this particular part. It just felt right for me and enjoyed it. Virginia Brown, that's Pat. I'm Nancy. I mean Nancy. <laughs> 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 I haven't ever gotten that straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Nancy. Um, well, I would say absolutely a full arc. I mean, to start really with just so little, little to go on and just you know, learns so much from the different characters. She still doesn't quite get it all. <laughs> There's a little ways to go, but um, I just so enjoyed playing that role. Very different for me, and uh, I don't know, funny, yet very poignant, and I'm honored that you asked me to do it, and I'm honored that I have these wonderful people to do it with. So thank you. I would say yes, definitely. <laughs> um, and comments as Emily. Yeah, Emily definitely had a full arc, and she started out in a dark place, and really, um, I think her, uh, the play was built around her being open to community, at least from, from my perspective. I loved playing Emily's character. I loved her humor, and what I also really loved was the way humor brought us all together. And I didn't know that. We, you know, we practiced this on Zoom for a few weeks before we came in here. And I didn't realize how funny all of the parts were and how well beautiful the timing was. So it was just a joy to read the, part, the play. And I really did love Emily and loved her darkness. And I love T.S. Eliot, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly Gibbs as Pat. <laughs> well, it was truly an honor to play Pat. And I would love to meet your mother sometime. Uh, it really it was. I, I loved her character, and I identified with her character. Uh, because I am, uh, I do need a zipper, and I do stand up, and I, so I could really get into the, the part, and so it felt full to me, um, because a, a lot of the, the characteristics of, of Pat that I identified with myself were all represented in the play. I also loved how she bounced off of all the other characters, and, um, and the characters were so beautifully written, and so distinctive. Um, and it was it was really fun to be the uh, uh, the big mouth in the play. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun with it. Thank you. You were a great big mouth. <laughs> you want to hear from them? Yeah, I mean, please. Remember Alice as Bill? Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, it was uh, you know it, it's uh, it's hard to do uh, find an art for me in. Um, Three or four pages, but definitely, uh, I enjoyed watching the the development of this play over time, especially from what felt like. I mean, it was immediate; like these ladies knew that they had a bond already. They took that bond and put it put nitrous in it almost. And you see that <laughs> go each week from one level. It was not two dimensional. 
but it definitely went to like six dimensions by the time we've moved here. Uh, I could just see the audience. I could feel the energy of what an audience would be doing in this environment. And um, truly, I think it's uh, obviously a reflection of how hard these ladies have worked, but also how well Pat and you have put together a script that gels so well. Daniel Wilson as um, Brad, is what I call Chad for the last yeah. uh, Kind of like what Matt was just saying, um, having to get a smaller role, but it was kind of fun because my character actually kind of going from the dreamy guy that they had their hearts on to, <laughs> by the way, I'm gay. <laughs> so it was kind of in that small frame, uh, was able to actually do the art. Um, but I thank you, Tony. I had a blast doing this, and I was master. It was great. You guys have the, the four ladies in there. You guys, it was great to see the banter back and forth, and, and you guys did such an amazing job. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. And Amanda, Amanda Delano as Amelia. Uh, I think I probably had the least amount of art for my character. <laughs> <laughs> but what was nice was having this contrast showing how, you know, you could be closer than you are with your own family, with, these, with your friends. In this, in, you know, especially the way that we've all come together within just a year of knowing each other. And Amelia is so different from who Emily is that you don't even expect her to act that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and having worked in a retirement home, you know, in my 20s, it was, I've seen that. I've seen the children coming in and they, they feel like they're doing good for their family, but they really are just completely oblivious. They have no clue, like, <laughs> just, just butt out at that point, you know. <laughs> and it's something we all need to be aware of is, you know, the compassion versus the taking care of the two completely different things, so. <laughs> I'm curious, do you think it works as a one app with a sort of complete follow through? Or is there, would there be a place to break this? Um, and I just, it's the opinions and, and to throw out there because Mom and I talked about that, like 90 minutes roughly, it could probably go either way. I'm just curious as to what. I, I, I feel that it's, it's written perfectly as a one act because, uh, because this group of women and, and this group of women that I got to work with, um, everything, you know, I, I made no decisions in this play. It, everything was consensual from day one um, to through today. And um, I, I, I believe if, if you were to make this a two act play, there would have to be some moment where they, they were at odds with each other, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think part of the beauty of this play is, um, and we can, we can all tell stories about our parents and people who are in their 80s, whether they're social, antisocial or whatever, I think one of the beautiful things about this as a one act play is they're skeptical to get together, but there's never um, a moment that they're not working to make each other feel better. And I think that's um, that's kind of an important message right now. And, and I think it's, it's more powerful in one, in one unit than it would be to be broken up, I think. It, it, it covers so many different aspects. Um, there's the there's there's the, the pathos and there's the humor and there's the uh, learning and there's the growing and everything in this short of time I think really is more powerful than it would be if it were not. You know? Well, I just have to say, like Daniel, you said he enjoyed doing it. Um, this has been, you know, we we've, we've only been online six times and then we're in the theater two days. Um, it's been a it's been a powerful experience for me because it's just been everything is is every day is more positive than the day before. Every day, more people are wanting to do what's for the greater good, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really beautiful to see. Can you it? Well, I just want to say something, and this is to your mom too, is that, and maybe it's for everyone who listened and watched and partook, but there were so many ways in which I could connect with these lines. There were so many things that I'll tab, and, you know, stuff from my past too. And, and there were so many connections. It's brilliant in that way. I really, really congratulate you, to the, you and your mom for being that uh, again. I just want to also add that I think it did work well as a, as a one act. And um, and I, I think someone kind of uh, mentioned this and I'll say it also that I really like how you and your mom 
wish you luck again. <laughs> um, you did a wonderful job of making um, four distinct women, well, all the characters very distinct, but for us, for the four women, you created four distinct characters, and it was it was easy, at least for me, and I think they felt the same way, to to make bring your our characters to life because you gave us so much to work with, right. and you could see that we were so each so different, and that made it more fun. Right? But thank you. Yeah, and just just to piggyback on what Linda says, I really appreciated how these characters were not stereotypic old people in an old folks home. You know, I mean, they talk about abortion, they talk about suicide. They, these are tough women like we know our mothers are. And they have, and I really also appreciated the sense of um, moving into a chapter where to lie sort of falls away. That, be, that becomes not important anymore. And to tell the truth becomes very important. And, you know, I mean, there's just a heartfelt need to, be real, um, and and I, I really appreciate that. I think it's because uh, all of us are approaching the end of life, and and in that. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, with one notable <laughs> exception. <laughs> but but because I'm of here. that, what? everything becomes. Hi, can you hear us? More profound and more important. Um, you know, you don't want to mess. I can hear you. <laughs> Pat is on <laughs> the line. Oh, 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 great. Um, but I don't know if you can hear her. I'll put you up as loud as you'll go. Go ahead and okay. speak. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I think you all did a fabulous job. I appreciate it and all that you put into it and all this practice. Now to you, Robert. Out <laughs> 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 of me disappeared. And all of you who know him know a bit of him appeared. Um, there were I would we would have these sessions and I'd say, Robert, damn it, 80-year-old women don't talk like that. <laughs> 80 year old women don't talk about that stuff. So I got <laughs> some of it out there and got back. Uh, Rob, you worked like a little dog to help your mother, and I do appreciate it, but I particularly want you all to look at the first two scenes. Um, I would like to work on those because, in all honesty, and Robert, buck up, um, we aren't that, we are political. We're very political. We're very all that in our hearts. But um, I can speak for my age group. We don't, and we just don't talk that way. So we've got to soften and bring that down, or you guys all run with it as you see it, and I'll back out. But that's, my critique, plus uh, there were things about it I really loved, things you did, things you added, Robert. There were some wonderful little laughs in there that you put, and I do appreciate that. So, um, and to the director, my God, you have worked hard on this, and boy, oh boy, do I appreciate you. Hey, <laughs> I would read a script and I'd play all the characters and she said, Rob, this this plays a lot of talking. It's a lot of exposition. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's that's what it is. And, uh, and so we'd go back and forth and I'd have to get it okay to move on. And it was very hard <laughs> to do. But this is a work in progress. And really what my suggestion should have been, be, hearing your voice in the back of my head was don't say anything good about it. Let's let Eddie's Please rip one part for his and one part. Because that's what my mom will appreciate is the constructive criticism that gives it another notch. Because I think this is something that she and I will still work on for another year or two or three or whatever we, we've done already. And uh, and so I'm just as grateful to everyone here. And maybe that would be a fun thing to hear, Mom. I don't know. How would you improve the character? That yeah. I appreciated everyone's good words. But what I really need is what they would do, what they saw, what occurred to them in their heads about how to improve it. That's where we have to go now. Um, I'm all for applause, but I really appreciate a good critique on this. Rip it apart. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 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 
we did work really hard on each um, each of the, the four ladies uh, bringing their own interpretations, their own emotions, their own responses to this without without trying to make some kind of uniform play out of it. And I think they, they really did do that. So I think given, given some time and, and them just sitting down with, with themselves and their own notes, I think they could give you um, some, some constructive comments about of, the, of their characters. I think right now it's difficult because we've worked so hard and so fast to get the play to, to be what you saw tonight. But I do think they, they have the, the ability, all four of them, to go back and say, um, you know, I, I would I would put a you know I I put a little Anne in my character. I could you know this might do this, and Linda puts a little Linda in her character. God only knows. <laughs> but I, I do think they, they can provide that for you um, as time goes on. Mike Rulon has a comment to make. Hi, I thank you to everyone. I really enjoyed watching this. I I got a lot of laughs, and and I could hear Chris laughing too. Um, Pat, I want to agree with you. Uh, <laughs> Pat, I, I agree with you about the dialogue. In particular, I, I found that there were parts of the dialogue that really sounded more like written discourse than spoken. Um, and I think that it would be good to, to sit down and, and just do some workshopping and find some, some ways to reword these things to make them sound a little bit more like how people of your demographic would actually speak. Um, but I will say that the character development is excellent, yeah. um, especially for a one act. Uh, I see some great arcs and there are some, some great uh, funny lines and some very poignant moments. And Linda, why do you always get to die? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <it's not> <laughs> Warren Duty also has some comments. Hi. Hi. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, first of all, I you know, I just want to say to uh, Pat and Bob how much I enjoyed it and I, I thought everybody read so well. I read the first There you are. Wave your hand. Hi Pat. Hello. Um, I read the, the first draft, I think back in July, but um, I did want to say, um, you know, in, in regard to Pat's note, that when I listened to it today, the one scene, and Bob, don't disown me because I don't want to get into a political discussion with you, even though I agree with most of your politics. Um, that scene three, um, like Michael said, is... Uh, it's like a series of talking points. Every other scene has an objective. Uh, you know, you got the one scene when um, Brad comes in and it's the talent show and you've got the, the come to Jesus scene, you know, that's the objective in that scene. You've got the last supper, you've got that objective in that scene. It's, it's scene three that doesn't ha really have um, a clear cut objective. It, it's uh, characters are um, they're not really talking to each other. They're, they're talking out at the audience. And um, I, you know, I would either trim it or I'd find a way to create some kind of, um, you know, some, some kind of objective that they can all work off of. Um, you know, the, I, I, find it, I find the reference to Mayor Daley and Chicago politics um, interesting, but they're in Florida now, and Florida is so political in its own right and problematic that if they're going to talk politics, why why wouldn't they talk about some of the issues that are that exist there right now? And um, so I, I just wanted to piggyback on on Pat's um, Pat's note, which I agree with. Okay, Robert. Sorry. But uh, one other thing, real quick. My favorite part, Pat. <laughs> Here. The stand-up routine. The stand-up routine was just great. <laughs> Do you have anything else to say, Pat? Oh, um, no, I don't have anything else to say. I'm happy now to hear you get into the critique of it because that's the way 
if we're going to go forward, we'll make it better. And guys, we've only got about a year to do it because I'm not planning on being around forever. So let's get going. <laughs> Finish this baby off. <laughs> Well, thanks, Pat, for giving us such a wonderful thing to, to devote ourselves to for a few weeks here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mom. I love you. Thank you. Love you. Thanks, guys. Hi, I, I'm the young person that set up the technology for Pat. Uh, thank you, guys. This was a really enjoyable afternoon. Thank you so much. You're not Amelia, right? <laughs> All right. That's Emily's daughter. Lauren, not a second city. Yeah, we met at Second City. Oh, oh, yeah. right, the the comedy workshop, right? Yeah. yeah, we're really impressive, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, uh, Pat, I have one more question for you. How come you didn't put Bob in the play? You've got Bill in there. Oh, because we'd have to talk politics. <laughs> 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 the reason why is because I am so much like you, Bob. It's, <laughs> it's true. Okay, if everybody is, is amenable, um, I think we'll wrap this up and, and call this um, a fantastic night for us. We're all going to go celebrate um, with our illustrious playwright here. Pat, I wish you could be with us. Um, and thank you all for joining in tonight to our play. Thank you.